okay, that car would have ruined it anyway. Yeah, really a screeching car. This is Reviewer Magazine. We're here with Daniel Lee Ross and his lady friend Bree. And uh, you guys should sit closer together, all closer together, so I don't have to scoot back, pan back so much. And um, I was talking to Daniel a few days ago, or maybe a week or so ago, at the Planet Ruth Gallery, where he was talking about his grandfather's uh, adventures in World War II, or back during the um, Nazi occupation of where was it, Germany or Poland? It is or? in Poland, in Krakow. Okay. Krakow, Poland. And um, he was Jew. He was Jewish. He's passed away already, or is he still alive? Yeah, he passed away. He had a he had a long battle with uh, his kidneys, and they were putting him on dialysis for the last, I'd say, seven years of his life, but periodically, and it just uh, turned worse. Mm. And he got pneumonia in the in the ICU. Oh bummer! Sorry to hear that. Getting, uh, dialysis here in, in San Diego. Here in San Diego, yeah. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about your family history. Well, and um, okay. yeah, Daniel, like uh, you know, your your uh, I guess your grandma owns uh, a building downtown or something. Yeah, my grandma Jackie Littlefield. She happens to run and operate the Speckles Building. Oh wow! For quite a while, uh, she's an enthusiast of uh, art, very appreciative of the arts, and uh, continuing live theater and opera in San Diego. Very cool. And uh, my father was adopted by her. Uh, he's no longer with us, and uh, he had an uh, interesting life, and okay. uh, the story was that his father, who I'm not quite sure who it was, I was led to believe for a while that it was Leonard Bernstein, but that turns out to not be as true as I would like it to be, but he was a famous composer, and had an affair with a ballerina, and my father was put up for adoption because of the circumstances hmm. in the time, in the 40s, uh, late 40s, it wasn't really acceptable, he was adopted and taken care of and raised well. And Where was this? A great family. Uh, mostly in Beverly Hills. They lived in Beverly Hills and they also lived in New York. Uh, they'd go back and forth. He attended Chesh Cheshire Academy okay. for a while. attended Beverly Hills High for a while. He has uh, two brothers and two sisters who are all really wonderful people. All right. And they work in the entertainment industry in New York and, and also Beverly Hills. And then your father is this the one who was uh, the son of your grandfather who this is from my father's side, and my mother, she's from a uh, Berlinski family, which was a German family who moved to Poland, and um, they were, uh, he was working there, his father was a businessman, and he would, he would invest the local other Jewish family's money for them, and uh, it turned out to be ill-timed. Because of the Nazi occupation, he, they, he lost a lot of their money. He was one of the first people to de declare bankruptcy in uh, Warsaw, which was the capital then in Poland. Yeah, well, you were, you were really uh, enthusiastic when you were telling me about this a in Planet Ruth uh, the other night. And you, you told me about how he got involved with uh, the, the black market kind of underground oh, yeah. uh, merchandising there, and the Nazis were going to kill him. They were threatening to blow his brains out if he didn't confess to it. And, and um, Yeah, you well, know, the story goes that... Uh, he was starting a black market, you know, because the Nazis were uh, taking away the rights of the Jewish people to uh, have free market, and so he brought it upon himself to black market, and uh, what happened was he was black marketing items like socks and paper, notepads, stuff like that, essential items, and uh, his best friend, whose name was Michael, I'm not sure his last name, which happens to be my father's name, also Michael, uh, alerted the Nazi authorities and they picked him up on a delivery and he didn't happen to have the official German papers for the items that he had and he was arrested and taken into a prison in this prison they would sit for 23 hours and be beat occasionally and then they would get up and were allowed to use the bathroom and then they'd have to sit again and he uh, now were these the, the local uh, police that were doing this like the, that like they, they weren't the they were like the Nazi SS or the Nazi I don't think it would be Nazi SS per se but it was uh, people of authority yeah under the German Nazi rule after okay they had taken Poland and assumed control of Poland like the the, the Polish version of the Vichy government I would assume the I'm collaborators not. Right, and and your and your your dad's friend Michael, who ratted him out, was he Jewish my too? My grandfather's, my grandfather's, your grandfather's he friend. Was, he was Jewish also, yeah. Huh. And uh, I don't know why, what his motives were, but he turned him in, and his father was arrested with him. Him, him, my grandfather, my grandfather's father, and Michael were all arrested together, and were interrogated, 
and they had had conversations in the prison and uh, when they were interrogated he noticed that some of the German officers were repeating information that was told while they were in the holding cell so he being a very smart person reasoned and at that time in the 30s it was very un uncommon to have recording devices but he yeah. figured that they had recording devices because they weren't too high tech right they were, they were repeating information that had only been spoken between him and his father so the hmm. Nazi officers threatened to take him out in the back and blow his head off pretty much in a matter of speaking and, pretty subtle. Uh, and left you know for them to talk about themselves whether or not they were going to admit to their crime and uh, he, his friend turned to him Michael and said uh, we should just come clean and tell them everything because he was a co-conspirator and my grandfather said no you don't understand the Germans they're very smart people they will understand this lie and they will punish us for it meaning that he would like to go along with the story because he knew that uh, they didn't have much information on him and that it was all based on this confession if they were going to persecute him. So he was like playing along. He was, he was playing like, along. He was playing the act and he was hoping his friend would catch on real quick and go, you know, you're right, we, we should just tell him the truth that we had nothing to do with this. Basically, so what happened? Did, did it, his friend catch on? His friend, did I think, caught on, you know, and uh, basically he was in it for himself. So he, uh, when the Germans came back in, he said, you know, I can't confess to something I didn't do. We were held here innocent, we uh, had the papers but we lost them, and it was a matter of misunderstanding and they actually let him go. And he went back to his family and they had all thought that he had already been murdered, and they immediately packed up all their belongings and left. Where'd they go to? Well, they, I'm not quite sure where they went, but I do know that they were apprehended and brought to a ghetto, a work mm. camp, and mm. they... Uh, he worked in this work camp and volunteered to be an electrician, although he knew nothing about being an electrician, he found some people while he was selected who were willing to train him. On so he was pretty young then? He was young, yeah. Time. I think like during the, I think the invasion happened when he was probably 18 or 19, mm. and so he was in his 20s, young, young, young guy. Yeah. Early 20s during his work camp experience. And he had other interesting stories, you know, uh, he happened to meet my grandmother in the work camp, and they would go to the fence every day and say, their words to each other and decided that they would get married eventually one day and that's the hope to get married to be free is what kept them alive they had each other oh wow my grandmother had her two sisters one of them was a baker and supplied her with some food so they weren't as malnourished as everybody else uh, although she did say that the lice was very terrible that she was completely covered and being eaten alive by lice nice and uh there was a story that wasn't told directly to me because it was too painful, but I heard a story that he had actually had to eat some of the rats that were in the camp in order to survive at one point. Good food. Yeah, and Good he eating. actually did break into the storage facility and steal food also for his, um, wow. I guess, comrades, you'd say, at that point. Huh. Um, now, I, I read a, uh, <clears throat> back in, uh, well, a few years ago, there was a book called Mouse, M-A-U-S, it was put out by Art Spiegelman. Are you familiar with him, Bree? I've heard of that book, yes. Yeah, it was a series of books. And it was like really good high art, avant-garde comic art, and where he tells about his father, who was a concentration camp a survivor, and a lot of them came from Poland. Mm. Like in, I think Warsaw was the city that they came from. The um, highest volume family. of Jews uh, murdered in that atrocity were from Poland. Yeah, Three and they, million, they went to they went to like uh, Auschwitz, I think. Yeah. In, in the book, it's called Mauschwitz. Yeah. Because all the all the Nazis are cats, cats and um, the Americans are dogs, and uh, and, and the Jews, the are rats. Jews are the Jews are mice. Mice, yeah. Mouse whips. Well, that's a nice way of putting it, mice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, mice are mice are not as considered as uh, not as evil as rats. I don't. Know. <laughs> Some people right. don't like rats for, for whatever reason. Mice are more. Yeah, they're yeah. innocent. Well, you know? that term <laughs> is, is a lot. It's not as degrading. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that term is, is a lot though. The they're cuter. You know, rodents, rats. Right. Of that oh yeah, to, to exterminate them. Yeah. Dehumanize, yeah. Right, right. So did your did your grandpa end up having to go to a concentration camp? He didn't go to a killing camp, a murdering camp, a, a concentration camp. Uh, he was lucky enough to be liberated from the work camp. In time. In time, yeah. Well, so he was at a work camp before they sent him to an extermination type camp like Auschwitz. Yeah, usually they would try to work the young males to to the point of death and then exterminate them. Rather, you know, I mean the Germans like. I take a macro philosophy on a lot of these things in, in life, and uh, and with that said, the Germans are are an efficient people. I, I believe. I mean, I, I'm I'm German. Berlin is a German name, and I, I, I identify with being efficient. 
So for them to use the forced labor in order to dig ditches, make roads, you know, manufacture their arms and munitions, doorknobs, anything that they needed, they were they were trying to win a world war. They were trying to dominate the whole world. So they did. So I think uh, to, from a, from a war making standpoint, it probably would have been more efficient to to take the males of uh, conscript age and put them to work in the war machine and not have to, you know, well, you'd have mean, to worry all, about all the work that it took to, to put all the other people to death, they, they could have used those same people in the front lines. I'm sure there were some you know? people who volunteered to join the German army, I know that's, a, I know that's true, but um, I don't know, if I was an admiral or any kind of uh, overseer of an army, I wouldn't want to enlist my enemy in my army. You know, mm. as for fear of revolt or whatever, you know. Yeah, I guess that might be true. Jews are pretty resilient people. I mean, they fought the Romans for 70 years, and they're still here after the Holocaust. So, good point. So your your grandpa made it out, and, and he, he made it out. He uh, he he uh, he opened had a up family, a, and yeah, he opened up a nightclub. What he did after the war, after he was liberated, he was liber liberated by the Russians, and he knew German, he knew Russian, he knew Polish. So he uh, went to the Russians and he said, I will work for you, I'll come and do your necessary items, whether it's food or supplies, and he would, he got a badge from the Russians and he would go to uh, Nazi sympathizers mostly and confiscate, you know, whatever he needed to do, whether it was like motorcycles or, mm -hmm. or um, cat cows, you know, for food and would bring them to the Russians. And for, for this, uh, for this barter, he was supplied with a two-bedroom apartment, and uh, underneath was a nightclub. He opened a nightclub strictly for Jewish people, a jazz club, hmm. a big band, you know. Nice. And then he came to America, to Cleveland, with some family, and uh, one, my uncle at that time, uh, or I think it was a great uncle, it would be, um, had an alarm company, and he learned the business there, and then he came out to San Diego, and he m opened Morris Alarm Systems which is a, was a very successful company. Is it that one right there? Uh, let's see, where is it? Up on the wall, halfway up, above the... No, probably not. Halfway up. I've, I've seen those, yeah. It have a sticker it's with red, it's red. It has a, yeah, usually it has it's a yellow. It's a big bell. It's a yellow, it's a red bell, big, it looks like. Big. I think that's a sticker right there. I don't know, that's not one. it though. I've seen that though. Yeah, it's I've all over those. the city. If, you, if you're in San Diego and you look around, you'll see a, it's a big circular, yellow sticker with a black bell it says Morris on it. Okay. And we sold, I think they sold to SD Alarms. Alright, I've seen it before. Yeah. So out of all of this, did your grandpa uh, become more of a um, uh, a spiritual person? Did he start going back to his roots, going to temple, and or no, did he go the opposite all. direction? He went the opposite direction. I'd say yeah. He uh, didn't believe in love for a very, very long time, although he was married to my grandmother for 53 years, I think. Wow. And it wasn't until my my uh, my mother was born, Susan Ross, who uh, changed his perspective, and he once again started becoming religious and would attend synagogue. Both my grandmother and my grandfather were pretty uh, strong roles in the synagogue that we attended. Uh, mm -hmm. San Diego Jewish Academy. I went there, private school. You know, I was raised with my history. I understood it for what it was. You know. Yeah, you know, it's a good place to learn the arts and learn history. Yeah, it's a I really dig that t-shirt you're wearing. Oh yeah, this is Crowley. Alistair Crowley. Yeah, <laughs> with a rainbow pentagram. Yeah, this is his famous uh, two hands in front of him pose yeah. photo. Yeah. But um, cool. So uh, I'd like to I'd like to hear you do some of your uh, your great music on video here. You sent me some some tracks the the other day that sounded very polished and ready for the big time. I mean, I guess you you. Re recorded that on at home on your computer or something. Yeah, really well, good. I was uh, I've been into rock and roll and Bob Dylan for a really long time. That's I started playing guitar when I was 10 years old and now I'm 24 and it kind of grew into a electronic infatuation and I started DJing around San Diego at the clubs with a group called Color Vision and um, I outwore my taste for it. And I decided to do something, instead of playing other people's music, I decided to make my own. So I made a, a record under the name of Private Lives. Mm -hmm. And I keep it all hidden for the most part, but I'm starting to play shows now. Cool. So I'll be playing a show um, December 17th at Portugalia uh, for a friend just playing a show. I plan at Planet Ruth for well, the first show. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot.
Um, let's go do some video, Daniel. Cool.